Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Suzanne Nossel, and I am the CEO of PEN America. On behalf of our president, Ayad Akhtar, who wanted very much to be here with us today, our members, board of trustees, and staff, I want to welcome you to stand with Salman, defend the freedom to write. I want to thank our partners, the New York Public Library, Penguin Random House, and House of Speakeasy. I want to recognize those in solidarity, Penn International, the Authors Guild, Bronx Academy of Arts and Dance, Fledgling Writers Workshop, Ars Poetica, Cave Canem, Brown Council on the Arts, Little Puss, the Pre Puss Press, New York Writers Coalition, Center for Fiction, Lambda Literary, Amer Asian American Writers Workshop, New Press, New Yorican Poets Cafe, Kundiman Guild, Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, Whiting Foundation, Council of Literary Magazines and Presses. Thanks to all of you for being here with us. After opening remarks, we will turn to our remarkable readers. When we close, in just about one hour, we will pose a historic group portrait to send a message to Salman and to the world. So please stick around. You can also write a message directly to Salman at our table on the right. Those will be delivered directly to him. When a would-be murderer plunged a knife into Salman Rushdie's neck, he pierced more than just the flesh of a renowned writer. He sliced through time, jolting all of us to recognize that horrors of the past were ha hauntingly present. He infiltrated across borders, enabling the long arm of a vengeful government to reach into a peaceful haven. He punctured our calm, leaving us lying awake at night, contemplating the sheer terror of those moments exactly one week ago on stage at Chicago. And he shattered our comfort, forcing us to contemplate the frailty of our own freedom. Today, we gather to stand with Salman, our Star Wars leader and comrade who is enduring agony wrought by a 33-year-old vendetta, a death warrant that refused to die, a declaration of never-ending war on words. Authors, the talent, vision, and magical phrases that inspire audiences are the power users of free expression. If they cannot pursue their craft without fear, none of us is safe to say our piece. So we stand with Salman in an effort to boost his but also in a determination to stiffen our spines. As we consider how to channel our distress, Salman's life offers a guide. After nearly a decade in hiding, when he finally felt able to move around the world again, Salman returned to the literary circuit with its readings, festivals, and parties, especially the parties. He threw himself into the work of PEN America, an organization that had stood alongside him in his darkest days. He became our president in 2004 and founded the Penn World Voices Festival a year later. He's been a constant, indefatigable champion of words and of writers attacked for those, the purported crime of their work. Turn crisis into calling. I'll give just one example. In 2015, a South African novelist from family made a remark praising Salman's work. She was attacked by men who put a knife to her throat and a brick to her head. She then came under intense pressure to renounce her words and publicly avow religious devotion. When she refused, she was forcibly committed to a mental institution with the assent of her family. She reached out to Salman, who sprang into action. He activated Penn colleagues around the world. He maintained continuous contact with her at all hours of the night. He was her lifeline. Her father confessor, as he put it, at a time when she had no family, friend, doctor, or lawyer she could trust. He helped her draft public statements, mobilized his personal friends. He had his visible support could inflame matters further, so he did it quietly behind the scenes. 
Over two and a half days, I got more than 30 emails from Salman, working relentlessly until the writer was freed. For me, it was part of the job. For him, it was an act of conscience. For all their years of tracking and stalking, the Ayatollahs and their accomplices badly underestimated this target. Not even a blade to the throat could still the voice of Salman Rushdie. Not for a minute, certainly not for a week. Yesterday, we heard from Salman, who knows about this event and was intending to watch the stream. He offered some ideas of what things we should choose. Take that, Ayala. Take that, assailant. That brings me to today, this gathering. We come together in solidarity and defiance, but we all in celebration. We've gathered some of Salman's friends and colleagues. Gay Talese, who was part of Penn's mobilization for Salman back in 1989. Roy Ayan, who has personal experience of being targeted by the Iranian government on US soil. We come together for a celebration of life, but in the truest sense, rejoicing that Salman survived and will recover. It reminds me of something he said about the Penn World Voices Festival, and I quote, we can turn it into a celebration. We can turn it into a way of looking at people's work as work, not just because they are in jail or tortured, but to talk about them as artists. And I think that's what they want. Salman spoke for scores of writers who've been persecuted and tormented and did not want their ordeals to subside their identities or to drown out their imaginations. So fittingly, today we will celebrate Salman because of what he has endured, but even more importantly because of what he has engendered. The stories, characters, metaphors, and images that he has to the world. Perhaps above all, we see Salman's perseverance, his creative perseverance and bounty, his perseverance in the face of peril, his perseverance on behalf of ideals and principles that we must recognize will never be truly secure and will always demand our vigilant, valiant defense. At a time when book and curriculum bans are spreading like forest fires across this country, when lies and disinformation are engulfing our politics, we cannot hope for the best. We cannot look away. We cannot falter. We need to fight with vigor as if all our freedoms depended on it, because they do. Hoping that Salman is indeed tuned in from the hospital, in closing, I want to say to him, Salman, all week, I've found myself thinking about what you would hope we would say or do. How would you have us meet this moment? You're the, you are the voice in my head steering what it means in principled defense of free expression. I hope we do right by you. And even more than that, I hope and hold faith that you will very soon be back in action where you belong, helping to lead this fight. Thank you very much, and over to uh, our representative from the New York Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Many thanks to Penn America for helping to bring us together and for their steadfastness of the freedom of expression that is a value our two institutions share. That is why we are here. That is why we are in the steps of the New York Public Library, this great symbol of free and open access to information for all. We are here to safeguard the very principles that are at the heart of what our library and all libraries stand for. The free exchange of ideas and the ability for everyone, for anyone, to have access to books, to knowledge, to information. That's been the cornerstone of our mission for more than 125 years. 
Salman Rushdie has been a devoted advocate for free expression. He's also a longtime friend of this institution and has spoken here on those topics many, many times. We are so proud to have his books on our shelves. In 2008, we named Salman a library lion to honor his commitment to exploring the depths of creative expression and for being a defender of free thought. In recognition of this shared commitment, we join Penn today. It is critical that writers, all writers, all thinkers, all people, all voices, feel safe and empowered to share their and their vision with the world. The library is a champion of freedom. The freedom to read, the freedom to speak, the freedom to learn, and yes, the freedom to write. Now more than ever, we fight for those freedoms and we stand against censorship, we stand against fear, and we stand against silence. Now please join me in welcoming Dwayne Betts to our readings. I am here because Solomon Rushdie's words matter. And I am here because today he cannot say those words to you, but, but we can. My name is Reginald Dwayne Betts, and I am a poet. From The Power of the Pen, 2005 Arthur Miller Lecture at the Pen World Voices Festival, given by Salman Rushdie. A butterfly flaps his wings in India, and we feel the breeze on our cheeks here in New York. A throat is cleared somewhere in Africa, and in California there's an answering cough. Everything that happens affects something else. So to answer yes to the question before us, and not to make a large claim, books come into the world, and the world is not what it was before those into it. The same can be said of babies or diseases. Books, since we are speaking of books, come into the world and change the lives of their authors for good or ill and sometimes change the lives of their readers too. This change in the reader is a rare event. Mostly we read books and set them aside or from us with great force and pass on. Yet sometimes there is a residue that has an effect. The reason for this is the always unexpected and unpredictable intervention of that rare and sneaky phenomenon. Love. One may read and like or admire or respect a book and yet remain entirely unchanged by its contents. But love gets under one's guard and shake things up. Such is its sneaky nature. When a reader falls in love with a book, it leaves its essence inside him, like radioactive fallout in an arable and after that, there are that will no longer grow in him, while other stranger, more fantastic growths may occasionally be produced. We love relatively few books in our lives, and those books become parts of the way we see our lives. We read our lives through them, and their descriptions of the inner and outer worlds become mixed up with ours. They become ours. Love does this. Hate does not. To hate a book is only to affirm to oneself what one already knows or thinks one knows. But the power of books by both love and hate is an indication of the ability to make alterations in the fabric of what is. Amen. Thank you. My name is Jeff. And when I was 20 years old, I was traveling to London. 
and uh, having just read Midnight's Children and loved it, I thought it might be a nice idea to meet the author. So I looked him up in the London phone book. There it was, under the R's, Rushdie Salman, along with an address and a telephone number. I took the two out to his house. As it turned out, Salman wasn't at home. He was in Italy, vacationing. But his mother-in-law let me in to the house. We chatted a while. I told her while I was there, she got me a piece of paper. I wrote a note to Mr. Rushdie, and I left it for him, and then went back to my hotel. That was the world we used to live in, a world where the only craziness that could be visited upon a writer came in the form of a young, over-exuberant reader who showed up at his doorstep. That world was called civilization. Let's try to hang on to it. My name is Siri Hustvet. I am reading from the third person memoir, Joseph Anton. The passage comes from early in the book. I am reading it in honor of a dream, a dream of genuine, democratic, perspectival pluralism, a pluralism that acknowledges not only the mixed, impure, complex realities of history, but of every person's hybrid becoming is her, their own history, and the right to free expression in fiction and nonfiction with ruthless sincerity or irony. Without this freedom, Literature is nothing but an echo chamber of the fleeting platitudes and truisms that afflict every culture. We have more than enough of that in the debased world of media. It is time to listen and listen carefully. It was unsettling not to understand why shape of life had changed. He often felt meaningless, even absurd. He was a Bombay boy who had made his life in London among the English, but often he felt cursed by a double unbelonging. The root of language at least remained, but he began to appreciate how deeply he felt the loss of other roots and how confused he felt about what he had become. In the age of migration, the world's millions of migrated selves faced colossal problems. Problems of homelessness, hunger, unemployment, disease, persecution, alienation, fear. He was one of the luckier ones. But one great problem remained, that of authenticity. The migrated self, became inevitably heterogeneous instead of homogeneous, belonging to more than one place, multiple rather than singular, responding to more than one way of being, more than averagely mixed up. Was it possible to be, to become good at being, not rootless, but multiply rooted? not to suffer from a loss of roots, but to benefit from an excess of them. The different roots would have to be of equal or near equal strength, and he worried that Indian connection had weakened. He needed to make an act of reclamation of the Indian identity he had lost or felt he was in danger of losing. The self was about its origins and its journey. 
To know the meaning of his journey, he had to begin again at the beginning and learn as he went. It was at, at this point in his meditations that he remembered Salim Sinai. This West London-based proto-Salim had been a secondary character in his abandoned manuscript, The Antagonist, and had deliberately been created as alter ego. Salim, in memory of his Bombay classmate, Salim Merchant, and because of its closeness to Salman and Sinai, after the 11th century Muslim polymath, Ibn Sina, Avicenna, just as Rushdie had been derived from Ibn Rushd. The Salim of the antagonist was an entirely forgettable fellow and deserved to drift up a Ladbroke grove into oblivion. But he had one characteristic that suddenly seemed valuable. He had been born at night, August 14, 15, 1947, the freedom at midnight moment of India's independence from British rule. Maybe Salim, Bombay Salim, Midnight Salim needed his own book. He himself had been born eight weeks to the day before the end of the empire. He remembered his father's joke. Salman was born and eight weeks later ran away. Salim's feet would be even more impressive. The British would run away at the exact moment of his birth. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, I want to thank you all so much uh, for coming out today. Um, there's a line from the Muwalakwat, which are a series of um, sixth century pre-Islamic poems that were hung in marketplaces. Uh, in the Arabic world, uh, and one of the lines from that series of poems says, is there any hope that this desolation can bring us solace? And I think if we examine it, it's very difficult to look at, at these times and to find some solace, but one of the things that I'm uh, excited for is when Salman comes back and has something to say to us. He has always risen to the moment, and I think he will have something to profound to say about who we are, where we are, and where we're going, because he has always done so. And as you recall, uh, when the terrible things unfolded in, in Paris with uh, Charlie Hebdo, people went around um, with t-shirts saying, you know, je suis Charlie. Well, today, nous sommes Salman. This is a piece from The New Yorker. It's called Kansas. It was written in 1992. It's about Salman's first ever short story. Kind of appropriate. I wrote my first story in Bombay at the age of 10. Its title was Over the Rainbow. It amounted to a dozen or so pages dutifully typed up by my father's secretary on flimsy paper. And eventually it was lost somewhere on my family's mazy journeyings between India, England, and Pakistan. Shortly before my father's death, Seven, he claimed to have found a copy moldering in an old file, but despite my pleadings, he never produced it, and nobody else ever laid eyes on the thing. I've often wondered about this incident. Maybe he didn't really find the story, in which case he had succumbed to the lure of fantasy, and this was the last of the many fairy tales he told me. Or else he did find it and hugged it himself as a talisman and a reminder of simpler times, thinking of it as his treasure, not mine, his pot of nostalgic parental gold. I don't remember much about the story. It was about a 10-year-old Bombay boy who was in a rainbow's beginning, a place as elusive as any pot of gold end zone and as rich in promises. The rainbow is broad, as wide as the sidewalk, and is constructed like a grand 
staircase. The boy, naturally, begins to climb. I have forgotten almost everything about his adventures, except for an encounter with a talking pianola, whose personality is an hybrid of Judy Garland, Elvis Presley, and the play singers of Hindi movies, many of which made The Wizard of Oz look like kitchen sink realism. My bad memory, what my mother would call a forgetter, is probably just as well. I remember what matters. I remember that The Wizard of Oz, the film not which I didn't read as a child, was my very first literary More than that, I remember when the possibility of my going to school in England was made as exciting as any voyage beyond the rainbow. It may be hard to believe, but England seemed as wonderful a prospect as Oz. The wizard, however, was right there in Bombay. My father, Anis Ahmed Rushdi, was a magical parent of young children, but he was prone to explosions, thunderous rages, emotional lightning, puffs of dragon smoke, and other methods of the type also practiced by Oz, the great and powerful, the first wizard deluxe. And when the curtain fell away and his growing offspring discovered, like Dorothy, the truth about adult humbug, it was easy for me to think, as she did, that my wizard must be a very bad man indeed. It took me half a lifetime to work out that the great Oz's of Provita Sua fitted my father equally well, that he too was a good man, but a very bad wizard. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First, I have a message for photographers who want you to make a huge fuss. Hold up your signs, give out a big cheer, and let everyone, including Salman, who's hopefully watching this, hear your presence and that you're here and that you're supporting him. So hold out your signs. Great. Thank you. My name is Roya Hakakian. I'm here today both on, in, in three capacities. One, as an avid reader of Salman. Two, as a fellow writer. And three, as an Iranian who wants him and everyone else to know that we stand with him and we are all in the Thank you. I'm reading a passage from Harun and the Sea of Stories from chapter one, the Shah of Blah. There was once in the country of Aleph Bey a sad city, the saddest of cities, a city so ruinous and sad that it had forgotten its name. It stood by a mournful sea full of fish, which were so miserable to eat that they made people belch with melancholy even though the skies were blue. In the north of the sad city stood mighty factories in which, so I'm told, Sadness was actually manufactured, packaged, and sent all over the world, which never seemed to get it. Black smoke poured out of chimney of the sadness factories and hung over the city like bad news. And in the depths of the city, beyond an old zone of ruined buildings that looked like broken hearts, there lived a happy young fellow by the name of Harun, the only child storyteller Rashid Khalifa, whose cheerfulness was famous throughout the unhappy metropolis and whose never-ending stream of tall, short, and winding tales had earned him not one, but two nicknames. To his admirers, he was Rashid, the ocean of notions, as stuffed with cheery stories as the sea full of glumfish. But to his jealous rivals, he was Shah the Blah. To his wife, Soraya, Rashid was, for as loving a husband as anyone could wish for, 
And during these years, Harun grew up in a home in which, instead of misery and frowns, he had his father's ready laughter and his mother's sweet voice raised in song. Then something went wrong. Maybe the sadness of the city finally crept in through the windows. The day Soraya stopped singing in the middle of a line, if someone had thrown a switch, Harun guessed there was trouble brewing, but he never suspected how much. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm reading from an excerpt from Salman's novel, The Golden House. <clears throat> In the grassy quadrangle of the gardens, I crawled before I could walk. I walked before I could run. I ran before I could dance. I danced before I could sing. I learned stillness and silence and stood motionless and listening in the garden's heart on summer evenings sparkling with fireflies and became, at least in my own opinion, an artist. Or to be precise, a would-be writer of film and in my dreams of future, even in the grand old formation of an auteur. I've been hiding behind the first person plural and may do so again, but I'm getting around to myself. I, I am, but in a way, I'm not so different from my subjects who were self-concealers. The family who was right around my neck provided me with a big project for which I had with growing generation been searching. What was it that Israel said at the outset of goodbye to Berlin? I am a camera with its shutter open quite passive, recording, not thinking. But that was then, and this is the age of cameras that do all of one's thinking for one. I'm a smart camera. I record, but I'm not exactly passive. I think I alter, possibly I even invent. To be an intro is very different from being a literalist. Joe's picture of a starry night doesn't look like a photograph of a starry night, but it's a great depiction of a starry night. Let's just agree that I prefer the painting to the photograph. I am a camera that paints. Thank you. A.M. Holmes, and I'm going to read excerpts from Salman's Arthur Miller's Freedom to Write Lecture, delivered at the Penn World Voices Festival in May of 2012, on censorship. No writer ever really wants to talk about censorship. Writers want to talk about creation, and censorship is anti-creation, negative energy, uncreation, the bringing into being of non-being. Censorship is the thing that stops you doing what you want to do, and what writers want to talk about is what they do, not what stops them doing it. Consider, if you will, the air. Here it is, all around us, plentiful, freely available, and broadly breathable. And yes, I know, it's not perfectly clean or perfectly but here it is nevertheless, and plenty of it, enough for us and lots to spare. When breathable air is available so freely and in such quantity, it would be redundant to make that breathable air be freely provided to all in sufficient quality, quantity for the needs of all. What you have you can easily take for granted and ignore. There is just no need to make a fuss about it. You breathe the freely available, breathe the breathable air, and you get on with your day. The air is not a subject. It is not something most of us want to discuss. Imagine now that somewhere up there you might find a giant set of and that the air we breathe flows from those faucets, hot and cold air and tepid air in some celestial mixer you And imagine that an entity up there, not known to us, or perhaps even known to us,
begins on a certain day to turn off the faucets one by one. But slowly we begin to notice that the available air, still breathable, still free, is thinning. The time comes when we find that we are breathing more heavily, perhaps gasping for air. By this time, many of us would have begun to protest, to condemn the reduction in the air supply, and to argue loudly for the right to freely available, broadly Scarcity, you could say, creates demand. Liberty is the air we breathe, and we live in a part of the world where, imperfect as the supply is, it is nevertheless freely available. At least to those of us who aren't black youngsters wearing hoodies in Miami and broadly breathable, unless of course we're women in red states trying to make free choices about our own bodies. Perfectly free and perfectly breathable, but when it is breathable and free, we don't make a song and dance about it. We take it for granted and get on with our day. And at night, as we fall asleep, we assume we will be free tomorrow because we were free today. The Creative Act requires not only freedom, but also this assumption of freedom. If the creative artist worries he will still be free tomorrow, then he will not be free. If he is afraid of the consequences of his choice of subject or the manner of his treatment of it, then his choices will not be determined by his talent, but by fear. If we are not confident of our freedom, then we are free. Great art, or let's just say more modestly, original art, is never created in the safe middle ground, but at the edge. Originality is dangerous. Challenges, questions, overturns assumptions, unsettles moral codes, disrespects other such entities. It can be shocking or ugly, or to use the catch-all term so beloved of the tabloid, controversial. And if we believe in liberty, if we want the air we breathe to remain powerful and this is the art whose right to exist we must not only defend, but celebrate. Art is not entertainment. At its very best, it is a revolution. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Hari Kunzru. I'm a novelist and a columnist at Harper's Magazine, and, but mainly I'm here as a, a friend of Salman. And Salman once wrote that the role of the writer is to name the unnameable, to point at frauds, to take sides, start arguments, shape the world, stop it from going to sleep. And that's why we're here, because we owe it to him to stay awake and to use our words to shape the world. And so, uh, I will read the opening of the Satanic Verses. To be born again, sang Jibril Farishta, tumbling from the heavens. First, you have to die. Hoji, hoji, to land on the bosomy earth. First, one needs to fly. Tata, takatun. How to ever smile again, if first you won't cry. How to win the darling's love, mister, without a sigh. Baba, if you want to get born again, just before dawn, one winter's morning, New Year's Day thereabouts, two real, full-grown, living men fell from a great height, 29,002 feet, towards the English Channel, without benefit of parachutes or wings, out of a clear sky. I tell you, you must die. I tell you, I tell you, and thusly and so beneath the moon of alabaster until a loud cry across the night Oh, to the devil with your tunes. Words hanging crystalline in the iced white night. In the moon, you only mime to playback singers, so spare me these infernal noises now. The tuneless soloist had been cavorting in moonlight as he sang his impromptu guzzle, swimming in air, butterfly stroke, breast stroke, bunching himself into a ball, spread eagling himself against the almost infinity of the almost dawn, adopting heroic postures, Rampant, couchant, pitting levity against gravity. Now, happily toward the sardonic voice. Oh, hey, salad baba, it's you, too good. What ho, old chumch? At which the other, a fastidious, falling headfirst in a gray suit with all the jacket buttons done, arms by his sides, taking for granted the improbability of the bowler hat on his head, 
pulled a nickname hater's face. Hey, Spuno, Jibril yelled, eliciting a second inverted wind. Papa London by, here we come. Those bastards down there won't know what hit them. Meteor or lightning or vengeance of God. Out of thin air, baby. Ta-dum, wham, nah. What an entrance, yeah, right there. Plat. Out of thin air. Followed by falling stars, a universal beginning, a miniature echo of the birth of time. The jumbo jet Boston, flight AI-420, blew apart without any warning, high above the great, beautiful, snow-white, illuminated city, Ogany, Babylon, Alphaville. But Jibril has already named it. I mustn't interfere. Proper London, capital of Vilayat, winked, blinked, nodded in the night. While at Himalayan height, a brief and premature sun burst into the powdery air, a blip vanished from radar screens, and the air was full of bodies, descending from the Everest of the catastrophe to the milky paleness of the sea. Who am I? Who else is there? Thank you. So much. Dearest Salman and dearest family of Salman, this past week so many of us realized we'd been counting on you to hold up. I hope you know that you can count on us too. We're here for you and we're here for the long haul. <laughs> so I am Karen Desai. And I'm going to read an ode to Salman's Bombay from Kishot, because readers and writers know that a novel keeps beloved people and places alive. Many, many years ago, when the sea was clean, the sea was clean and the night was safe. There was a road called Warden Road, not called that in in a neighborhood called Breach Candy, still called that more or less, in a city called Bombay, that now. Everything started there, and even though his story and Kishot's were both traveler's tales, journeying through many places and arriving in this strange and fantastical land, America, all their roads, all the roads led back to Bombay if you ran the movie backwards. The origin point of Brother's whole world was a little group of maybe a dozen houses on a low hill served by a nameless dead-end lane. It's no longer Sakari Bhandari Lane, the map's now called it, even though nobody knew where that was, dwarfed by the city that now surrounded them. He closed his eyes and walked backwards across continents and years, twirling his cane like a Raj Kapoor imitation chaplain tramp, only in reverse. Backwards up the nameless but now named lane he went, past the rail apartment building where the fictional Smile family once lived, called Dil Paris, Paz Pazir, Dil Pazir, which is to say acceptable to the heart arrived at a similar building, also rail, named Nuville, the city of light. And inside it, on an upper floor, a long apartment filled with soft cushions, sharp cats, and the unmistakable yodlings of the famous ghost sisters, Lata and Asha, singing the latest hit songs from the movies on Bianca Geetmala, the weekend chart show sponsored by a toothpaste emanating every Sunday from the walnut marquetry, art deco, telly, funken, radiogram in the living room. And in the middle of the living room, large Persian rug, martini glasses in their hands, here were his ma and his pa in backwards, slow motion, dancing. That breech candy was a tiny little world long gone, preserved in the amber of memory like a prehistoric insect. Or a miniature universe 
the past captured under a glass dome like a tropical snow without snow. And in it, the tiny people of the past leading their microscopic lives. If the glass broke and they saw the world beyond their boundary, how terrified they would be of events all around them, as terrified as he had been when he encountered the titans of his adult world. Yet, minute as they were, the whole future flow, the little tropical snow globe without snow was the birthplace of everything brother had been and done. Thank you so much. I'm Tina Brown. Salman, my dear old friend, I'm proud to stand here for you today as you've stood up for so many in the last 33 years. You never asked for the role of a hero. You just wanted to be left alone to write. But in the tenacity with which you've defended free speech, you are a hero and have paid a terrible price. I wish you a speedy recovery and look forward to telling you in person how much your fight has meant to us all here today. These words that you wrote for the American Society of Newspaper Editors ring even more true now than they were in 1996. You wrote, my overwhelming feelings about the press are ones of gratitude. No writer could have wished for a more generous response to this work or for more fairer, more profiles than I have received in America and around the world. And in the long unfolding of the so-called Rushdie affair, American newspapers have been of great importance in keeping the issues alive, ensuring that readers have kept sight of the of principle involved, and even pressurizing America's leaders to speak out and act. Editors, like novelists, need to create, impart, and maintain a vision of society for their readers. In any vision of a free society, the value of free speech must rank the highest, for that is the freedom without which all the other freedoms would fail. Journalists do more than protect those values. For the exercise of freedom is freedom's best defense, and that is something you all do every day. However, we live in an increasingly censorious age. By this I mean that the broad international acceptance of First Amendment principles is being steadily eroded. Many special interest groups claiming the moral high ground now demand the protection of the censor. Political correctness and the rise of the religious right provide the pro-censorship lobby with further cohorts. I want to suggest to you that citizens of free societies, democracies, do not preserve their freedom by footing around their fellow citizens' opinions, even cherished beliefs, in free societies, you must have the free play of ideas. There must be an argument, and it must be impassioned and untrammeled. A free society is not a calm and eventless place. That is the kind of static, dead society dictators try to create. Free societies are dynamic, noisy, turbulent, and full of radical disagreements. Skepticism and freedom are indissolubly linked. And it is the skepticism of journalists, their show me, prove it, unwillingness to be that is perhaps their most important contribution to the freedom of the free world. The disrespect of journalists for power, for orthodoxies, for party lines, for ideologies, for vanity, for arrogance, for folly, for protection, for corruption, for stupidity, maybe even for editing, 
that I would like to celebrate and that I urge you all in freedom's name to preserve. My, friend, my friendship with uh, Salman Rushdie is based on the fact that we um, disagree on everything and argue about everything, not unlike the two characters of the short story out, which he wrote for an exhibition of my paintings. Um, I'm Francesco Clemente, I'm a painter. I will read a page from the In the South. Senior and junior, two very old men, opened their eyes in their bedrooms on the fourth floor of a sea green building on a leafy green, just out of sight of Elliot's Beach, where that evening the young would congregate, as they always did, to perform the rites of youth, not far from the village of the fisher folk, who had no time for such frivolity. The poor Puritans, by night and day, as for the old, they had rights of their own and did not need to wait for the evening. As the sun stabbed at them through their window blinds, the two old men struggled to their feet and lurched out on their adjacent verandas, emerging almost the same moment, like characters in an ancient game, trapped in fateful coincidences and able to escape the consequences of chance. Almost at once, they began to speak. Their words were not new. These were ritual speeches, obeisances to the new day, offered in call and response format, like the rhythmic dialogues or duels of the virtuosi of Carnatic music during the annual December festival. Be thankful, we are men of the South, said Junior, stretching and yawning. Southerners are we, in the south of our city, in the south of our country, in the south of our continent. God be praised. We are warm, slow, and sensual guys, not like the cold of the north. Senior scratched first his belly and then the back of his neck, contradicted him at once. In the first place, Senior said, the South is a fiction, existing only because men have agreed to call it that. Suppose men in the earth the other way up, we would be the Northern. The universe does not understand up and down, neither does a dog. To a dog, there is no North and South. In this regard, the points of the compass are like money which has value only because men say that it does. And in the second place, you are not that warm a character, and the woman would laugh to hear you call yourself sensual, but you are slow. That is beyond doubt. Thank you, Rashti, for celebrating life in all of its variety. Thank you. Uh, now that I can see that this event is being filmed, I hope you will be able to someday, Salman, and hear me say that I've been thinking about you every hour of every day for the past week, and that I love you as a brother and treasure the friendship we have built together over the past 30 years, and that Siri and I and all the other writers gathered here this morning are praying that you will be back on your feet before long and speaking out again in defense of the freedom and justice and tolerance you and all the rest of us so fervently believe in. The passage I've chosen to read comes toward the end of Joseph Anton, Salman's third-person memoir from 2012. 
It is one of the most eloquent descriptions of the power and importance of novels that I've ever read. In the pages of a novel, it was clear that the human self was heterogeneous, not homogeneous, not one thing, but many, fractured and con con contradictory. The person you were for your parents was not the person you were with your children. Your working self was other than yourself as a lover. And depending on the time of day and your mood, you might think of yourself as tall or skinny or un or a sports fan, or conservative, or fearful, or hot. All writers and readers knew that human beings had broad identities, not narrow ones. And it was the breadth of human nature that allowed readers to find common ground and points of identification with Bovary, Leopold Bloom, Colonel Bouya, Raskolnikov, Gandalf the Grey, Oscar Mazzarat, the Makioka sisters, the Continental Op, the Earl of Emsworth, Miss Marple, the Baron in the Trees, and Salo, the mechanical messenger from the planet Trophimador, and Kurt Vonnegut's The Sirens of Titan. Readers and writers could take that knowledge of broad-based identity out into the world beyond the rooms of books and use the knowledge to find common ground with their fellow human beings. You could support different football teams, but vote the same way. You could vote for different parties, but agree about the best way to raise your children. You could talk about child rearing, but share a fear of the dark. You could be afraid of different things, but love the same music. You could detest each other's musical taste, but worship the same God. You could, you could differ strongly on the question of religion, but support the same football team. That was what literature knew, had always known. Literature tried to open the universe, to increase, even if only slightly, the sum total of what it was possible for human beings to perceive, understand, and so finally to be. Great literature went to the edges of the known, and pushed against the boundaries of language, form, ability to make the world feel larger than before. Yet, this was an age in which men and women were being pushed toward ever narrower definitions of themselves, encouraged to call themselves just one thing, Serb or Croat or Israeli or Palestinian or Hindu or Muslim or Christian or Baha'i or Jew, and the narrower their identities became, the greater was the likelihood of conflict between them. Literature's view of human nature encouraged understanding, sympathy, and identification with people not like oneself. But the world was pushing everyone in the opposite direction, toward narrowness, bigotry, tribalism, cultism, and war. There were plenty of people who didn't want the universe opened, who would in fact, prefer it to be shut down quite a bit. And so when artists went on the frontier and pushed, they often found powerful forces pushing back. And yet, they did what they had to do, even at the price of their own ease and times of their lives. Thank you. Um, Salman, I know that you're uh, watching this on live stream, so I just want to say that I hope that you can feel the, the love, the support uh, out here in the audience that's here in front of the New York Public Library today, up here on the podium, the activism, and I hope, and uh, we are all hoping and praying that you heal as quickly as possible and get back to what you're what you do, which is right. 
This is from an excerpt from uh, Salman's new novel, Victory City, uh, which will be uh, coming out in February of 2023. I, Pampa Campana, am the author of this book. I have lived to see an empire rise and fall. How are they remembered, these kings, these queens? They exist now only in war. While they lived, they were victors or or both. Now, they are neither. Words are the only victors. What they did or thought or felt no longer exists. Only these words describing those things remain. They will be remembered in the way I chosen to remember them. Their deeds will only be known in the way they have been set down. They will mean what I wish them to mean. I myself am nothing now. All that remains is the city of words. Words are the only victors. Thank you. Hello, I'm Amanda Foreman. I'm Andrea Elliott. So, before we begin reading, I want all of us to send a message to Salman right now. So, on the count of three, I would like you to join me in shouting his name three times. And when we do that, we're going to raise our arms and our posters. Are you ready? Okay. One, two, three. Salman! 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. So today, Andrea and I will be reading a speech that Salman gave this May at the Pan America Emergency Congress of Writers. I want to talk about stories and storytelling because I think one of the ways of describing what is happening is a combat between narratives. Some narratives are truthful, some are untruthful, some are incompatible with other narratives, but a war of narratives is taking place. A tyrant has risen in Russia and brutally engulfed Ukraine, whose people, led by a satirist and hero, offer heroic resistance about creating a legend, a narrative of freedom. And the tyrant creates false narratives to justify his assault. The Ukrainians are Nazis, and Russia is menaced by Russian conspiracies. He seeks to brainwash his own citizens with such lying stories. Meanwhile, America is sliding back towards the Middle Ages, as white supremacy asserts itself, not only over black bodies, but over women's bodies too. False narratives rooted in antiquated religiosity and bigoted ideas from hundreds of years ago are used to justify this and find, it must be said, willing audiences in India where I come from, religious sectarianism and political authoritarianism go hand in hand today, and violence grows as democracy dies. Once again, false narratives are at play, narratives that privilege 
the majority and oppress the minority. And these narratives are popular, just as the Russians' tyrants lie are believed by many Russians. This now is the ugly dailiness of the world. These next words I read uh, in the honor of journalists everywhere. How should we respond? It has been said, and I say it now, that the powerful may own the present, but writers own the future. For it is through our work, or at least the best of it, the work through the future, through it, that the present misdeeds powerful may be judged and remembered. But how could we think of the future when the present screams for our attention? And if we turn away from posterity and pay attention to this dreadful moment, what can we usefully or effectively do? A poem will not stop a bullet. A novel cannot defuse a bomb. Not all satirists are heroes, but we are not helpless. Even after Orpheus was torn to pieces, his severed head floating down the river Evros went on singing, reminding us that the song is stronger than death. We can sing the truth and name the liars. We can sing in solidarity with our fellows on the front lines and magnify their voices by adding our own to them. Above all, we must understand that stories are at the heart of what is happening. And dishonest narratives of oppressors have proved attractive to many. So we must work to overturn false narratives of tyrants, populists, fools by telling better stories than they do, stories in which people might actually want to live. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Andrew Solomon. I'm a writer. I'm also a past president of Penn and a current trustee, and I'm a trustee of the New York Public Library. So I'm here in those multiple capacities, and I am the last of your members um, to come forward. After I finish, um, Susanna, um, our CEO, is going to get some of you up here, all up here, we hope, um, for a photograph so that we can remember how many people turned out um, for Salman and for freedom. I have just a brief passage to read. I'm also going to remark before I do so that it is not, so far as I can see, coincidence that this happened now. We are living in a time when the right of free speech has been under constant assault, both the left and the right, when there have been closures of libraries, books removed from schools, when everything that used to be tokens of America's freedom of speech is under threat. And so the idea that the fatwa managed to stay at bay for so long and that this appalling attack took place now is not happenstance. It's not happenstance, it's a reflection of something we all have to fight to control, to release from control so that free speech will again be ours. But far more eloquent than I am is Salman, who said in a speech that he gave for Penn at the opening of uh, the World Festival, in a truly free democratic society, all citizens must feel free all the time, whether they end up on the winning or losing side of an election, free to express themselves as they chose, free to worship or not worship as they please, free from danger and fear. If freedom of expression is under attack, if religious freedom is threatened, and if substantial parts of society 
they live in physical fear for their safety, then such a society cannot be said to be a true democracy. Thank you. That concludes our program. I want to ask all Penn staff, our partners, the writers who are here, to come and assemble here on the steps. We're going to do a photo. We're going to spell out the words, stand with someone. We're doing a group portrait. So uh, if you would like to be part of this, if you're one of our co-sponsoring uh, organizations, Penn member uh, here in the audience, please come with us uh, up on the steps and uh, be part of this photograph. Can they open the...